Hey guys, welcome. Um, before we begin, I really want to thank everybody for supporting me on Patreon. Um, this personal project is like I really I, I I took some time off from commissioned work to make this personal project and roll it into a tutorial and. Uh, having some income from Patreon really allows me to do that kind of stuff. So I'm really, I really appreciate everybody supporting me in that wall that allows me to create more of this, more of this content. So thanks so much, everybody, uh, especially Chris Heber for being a top Patreon. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's, let's dive into this, uh, into this project. It's been a while that I've done any bigger personal projects and did a tutorial about it, but hopefully this should make up for it. Um, so hopefully if you've seen my uh, the video uh, Spirit of Autumn uh, started out as a just I wanted to make a cool short thing and it was intended to be a personal project that would take only like a couple of days but since it turned out quite cool uh, while I was working on it it ended up taking a couple of weeks instead and because I kept just adding stuff which usually happens when I get enthusiastic with a uh, with a personal project and I thought it ended up really cool so I really poured a lot of effort in into it and uh, I think it turned out really cool and uh, now I decided to roll it out into a tutorial as well so uh, if you're new to Patreon thanks a lot for uh, for subscribing um, and I'm gonna go over in this tutorial over the project um, just go through all of the notes explain how I did certain things and why I did certain things I'm not gonna build it from scratch obviously because I cannot really condense couple of weeks of work into and re rebuild it basically so i'm just going to go through everything uh ex from a technical point of view it's not that complicated it's just a lot of small elements so i'm just going to go over it um and for me it was also kind of a fun learning experience because trying to get better at just, just like overall composition color uh, lighting shading and this was uh, something to like try to light a little bit better and stuff. Um, so uh, that was that's the introduction basically. Uh, before we dive into the actual project file, I'm going to go over Vellum instancing because that's something I used quite extensively in here um, to instance leaves because that simulates a lot faster. And then once we've done that, we'll dive into the regular project, uh, project file. So let me open up a new empty Houdini sequence and uh, let's dive into uh, into the vellum instancing stuff. All right, so uh, before we get started, uh, there, I include a couple of um, Megascans assets which I, which I used in the project. And of course I cannot include those because they're paid assets. Uh, they're quite cheap, but you need to, if you want to follow along and use the exact same materials, you need to get them from Megascans. I cannot include them, of course. So there's a document in the uh, download folder which includes all of the assets I used. I think it's like three, so it's not that many. Um, but you need to define your path where Megascans downloads your assets and define it in here. And then everything should be loaded up properly. Um, so you can just like go in bridge and then uh, search for those assets and then download those and then everything should work. Um, so yeah, with that, that out of the way, let's uh, yeah let's let let show let show what we're gonna make. Right. So as a first example, we're going to look at these uh, falling leaves, which is also which are also used in the end credits. Um, so I'm gonna go over how vellum instancing works and why I did it. So I even used it in places where there's a pile of leaves to begin with. So uh, in the beginning, for example, because it was it was faster to just uh, scatter a whole bunch of instances and have those um, be attracted by the velocities and, and the forces than have a pile to begin with and create all kinds of constraints inside that thing. Uh, was just faster overall to do with instances. So that's the, one of the first things that I built. I quickly discovered that it was going to be too heavy to have all of these thousands of leaves uh, being simulated individually. So let's um, let's go over how something like this works. So let's first just make a very basic uh, vellum setup ourselves. So let's just do it in here. Uh, let's create a grid. Uh, scatter a couple of points on it all right and let's uh, say something we want to emit so let's do another grid let's give it uh, make it smaller one by one so let's say we want to emit uh, this thing 
And then vellum cloth. Let's configure that to cloth. And so we'll call this geo. And then call this other thing constraints. And the points here, oh, not name, let's call this instance points. Right. Now let's make a dot network. Let's dive in. And let's make a vellum solver. And a vellum object. And a vellum source. And what you can do in the vellum source, you can um, give it a geometry path, and we need to put it to instance on points. So let's give it a geometry, and let's give it constraints, and let's give it points to instance on. So that's what we're doing here. And let's create uh, maybe a little bit less points, make it a little bit faster. And let's make this one a little bit uh, lower resolution as well. All right, and let's change our seed. So let's uh, put it in the seed. Let's put dollar f so it changes the seed every frame. And now you can see we're emitting instances. So let's add some forces here. Force, All right? And let's put some force down, and let's add some amplitude. Now you can see we're instancing vellum. So now we have falling grids, by, by the, basically. So these are just referring to one simple point. Um, so that's that's the basics of just emitting that whole thing. Now let's dive into the other network and see how I uh, switched up the uh, the leaves inside of the instance. So the way these assets get get loaded in when you use the bridge, they're basically. So if you go in here. What it basically does is it loads in the source, so that's all of the leaves, and it splits it out to different geometries here. Um, and then it sets up some instancing um, attributes. So if I go to instance, um, so if you look in this thing, you can see now we have a, so this is basically what it what it comes when you, when you load this up. So it will just instance some leaves in here. So if you go into, um, into this instance thing, what it's basically doing, it's setting some instance paths. So this is just pointing to the um, to the to to the original leaves. So what I did with some of the leaves is I added some custom animation because it also it it has some basic animation. If you go into the source, it has some animation parameters in here which will animate them. But what I also did is I added some because I wanted more variance, because the leaves were quite flat in the beginning, so I added some uh, some bend, which is uh, just driven by a uh, by a wiggle. So we're going to uh, the parameters. So this is uh, um, oh, this isn't this one is added, is driven by motion effects. So you can see this is just uh, this is driven by chops. Um, so I did that in a couple of uh, of them. Not not every single one, but some have like animated bands. So here's another one. So this won't come true in the simulation itself, but it will come true on the instances that are on the ground, basically. So um, yeah, those are, those are the basic instances. So it just it basically it just defines defines a path, and then instance sub will instance them on it, and this one will. Uh, do it another way so it will put op in front of it and then it will be this and then you can create it into regular geometry so what i was first doing is i was creating uh i was i was i was first trying to to just do it like this and then just throw this in a simulation um but that that gets really well maybe i can show you this gets very clunky very quickly. Uh, well, um, wait, let's put uh, solver. Well, I'm solver. 
All right, there we go. So maybe it'll work fine, but a lot of overlapping stuff will just be very slow. And in, without instances, it will just get very, very clunky, clunky very quickly. Let's check if it's going to give any issues here. Maybe it might not, but instancing is going to be a lot faster. This actually seems to work quite fine with this amount of instances, but if you have more, it might might give some issues. Anyway, uh, so on to the instancing workflow. So I haven't found a way to uh, switch instances inside of Vellum itself. So what I ended up doing, so if I go into this network here, so I, I'm using the, the, the Quixel assets, by the way, simple scattering assets, which are quite nice. Um, so I'm just, I'm scattering some points here. So I have a grid, I'm just scattering a couple of points. And then the, it's using a wrangle here to uh, give it a random ID. So basically it's, it's checking the number of points of the first input. So these have, this has packed objects. So these just count as points. So it's gonna check how many points do I have. So it's gonna be nine points. And this is gonna give it an ID. Um, so as you can see, you have an ID from zero to, uh, to eight. Um, defining age here, because I want to age my stuff, because uh, in the main thing, I'm also fading some in. Uh, defining p-scale here, even though that also happens here, but I just ended up doing it over there. And I'm having it in a little subnet over here, which has uh, two, two uh, different um, uh, inputs. So I'm gonna do a for each. So I'm gonna do for each ID. And I am, so I have this, uh, this whole bunch here. And then I'm basically going to remove everything that's not equal to the ID that I generated. So if it's ID zero, then I'm gonna remove everything that's called ID zero. Um, and then based on that, I am putting them in a, uh, in a, uh, a network here. So basically this just, um, this, this, this ends up generating one, one leaf and one constraint. And the other thing uh, goes into first input and this has all of the points. So this just generates all of the points, group points. Um, and again, this, on, this only has the, the zero ID. So then in this subnet, what you get is you get the leaf, you get constraints, and you get the instance points. Um, so I'm just, just doing that individually for every single leaf. So I have a couple of networks here. So if there's an easier way to do this by varying instances in Vellum, maybe there is, I don't know. I haven't found a way to do that. Um, so I'm just, I'm generating constraints and points for every for everything. So if I go in here, we just up these points. So you can see if I go in here, um, so these will get leave, leave, leave one, these will get leave two, these will get leave three, and for some reason this is now empty. Oh no, there they are. Uh, leave four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you go into, I can delete this thing, there's a leftover thing. So I can go in here and then what I'm doing is I just have multiple vellum sources uh, and I'm just referencing them to the sub path, the, the constraint path and the instance point path. And they all get instanced like this. And then in here, I just have a, uh, a null that that says uh, the start frame. And basically that's because I'm also using this instancing on some places where, for example, I only wanted to emit from the first frame to just pile them up. So I could, for example, also say, because if I'm, so let's, uh, let's dial the points down before the whole thing will, uh, will basically freeze to freeze. Um, so if I'm gonna emit this now, it will, it will emit all of these leaves. But if I say $f uh, equals one, then it will only equal one on the first frame. And after that, it won't. So then it only emits on one frame. I could also say $f um, 
below 10 so then it will, it will only emit the first 10 frames um, so let's put it to 10 again because so right if I do that and I could put this up to like 1000 example and then if I go in here so now I'm emitting a whole bunch of, uh, of leaves and they only emit on the first frame So that's basically the uh, the gist of how the leaf emitting was done. So with that out of the way, um, let's dive into the main scene and uh, talk about how the main scene was built and of the individual elements. But this was the, the, the main um, interesting part of it. So uh, see you there. All right, so we're back in the main scene. And again, you need to define the paths and everything. Um, so let's uh, look through our render cam. And this scene is quite heavy and gets might freeze every now and then and get quite unstable i had a ton of uh, freezes throughout the making of this uh, of this whole thing um so let me if i turn on all of the uh, all of the elements ready so it needs to think a little bit so that's the entire thing uh, so let's let's turn off a couple of these things. All right. So let's go over uh, all of the individual things. Um, all right. So let's uh, first things first. Let's um, let's let's go into the ground. So the ground is very simple. It's just a uh, well, it's a ground. It's basically how the ground was made. It's just a grid. Then mountain top. Subdivided the whole thing, uh, another mountain sub, add some detail, uh, UV project, so I get some uh, UVs on the top. Um, erode, I didn't end up using this. I was, uh, when, I, when I was first trying it out, what I wanted to, to be, because the eagle and the whole thing came later uh, when I, in the thought process. First, I just wanted leaves to float up and then like spikes emerging. So I thought I was going to use an erode uh, to like drive that in the shader. Uh, like the displacement. I didn't end up using that, so you can ignore that basically. Um, yeah, that's basically the ground, so that's that's quite simple. Um, the second thing is the orb. So, orb is also quite simple. Um, so, let's mm, check that. So, this is the orb, and it gets extruded a little bit, so it has some thickness. And it gets uh, gets UV with the uh, auto UV thing because uh, that's just easy. Um, yeah, scaled up a little bit over here, and I'm just using material fracture, uh, which is quite slow, but uh, it's just a very simple fracture, and it just made sense to do it. So, have some pieces. Then I am um, I'm transferring normals. And I'm putting the normals in here and multiplying it by noise and outputting it to velocity. So I getting I'm getting some velocity uh, on the on the pieces. Uh, not sure if that wants to visualize, but there's there's velocity pointing out. So that's uh, sometimes I'm not sure why the why these these visualizations sometimes just bug out. Which is very weird because it does have velocity. As you can see. Anyway, not really that big of a deal, but it's weird. It's probably a bug. Anyway, so it does have have like velocities, and these and this thing get just gets added into a very simple dop simulation. Um, so it's just an RBD solver, some drag, and then the RBD packed object, and it has inherent velocity from point velocity turned on. What it will do is it will take the velocity that I generated in here, so it's gonna look at the normals. Um, so these normals, um, wait, I can, maybe I can show you if I put this to normals as well. Really not sure, like I really hate why the visualization often just, just breaks. Um, anyway, so it, it will uh, generate velocities and then it will add those velocities um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the orb. So that'll make it explode outwards basically um, 
and this whole thing starts at frame one and I'm currently working at a uh, different frame. I started off with just a one to one, one uh, like 200 frame range, but that's a bad idea and I tend to not do it, but this was supposed to be a simple project. So I ended up later moving all of the keyframes, uh, but that's why this thing is still set to uh, frame one. Anyway, so, Yeah, so as you can see, it's just a, uh, it's just an explo exploding orb, quite simple. Then it gets, uh, it gets clamped to first frame here. Um, what happens here is, so here we have the transform, which is animating it upwards and tilting it back slightly. The tilting is because I also have some dirt later. Uh, you don't really see it in the render, but there's, it comes out of the ground and there's dirt and it rolls, needs to roll off of it. Um, and then the transform pieces here is basically what it's doing. If you look when it explodes, it transforms it down. So then it ends up just being some points. The way that works is transform pieces will take input geometry and then you can use P scale, for example, to, uh, yeah, to transform them down. So that's how I, uh, how I did that because, uh, when I initially started a project, I just thought it was just going to be an exploding orb with some dust coming out of it. The, the whole uh, bird thing idea came later. Uh, so yeah, I'm just trailing it and I have some velocity on it. And that's that's basically the, the basic orb stuff. Right. So... Yeah, that's basically the... Um, well, that that's the orb, and that's the orb that's gonna drive a lot of the uh, a lot of, a lot of the stuff. Um, so let's. What's a good thing to do? Oh yeah, let's first go over the grains. So I did some grains. So let's look up our uh, grain simulation. Uh, grains. Here we go. So let's dive in here. All right. So. <laughs> yeah, so if we go in here, yeah, basically what I'm doing is I take the ground mesh, so let's go, go over here, and I have a box where I want sort of a boundary area to be, and then I'm bullying out uh, just a piece of it, and then I'm merging a sphere into it which you don't really see that much. It's a little, like a little bulge. That's, that's basically what it is. And then over here, do another Boolean with the orb. So you have to, you don't have, have the geometry over there. Um, remeshing the whole thing. And then I'm just doing grains. So let's, uh, let's turn down the resolution for now because this is gonna be quite heavy. Let's copy this size and let's put it to just to one. And maybe do. Uh... All right, so this is just creating some points. And well, the constraints are also just going to be the points. But what I did is I just added a turbulence noise and put it to attraction weight. So that what that will do is you can see it in the color as well. Maybe if I put it to uh, background to dark. So you see some color, so the attraction weight will have will get it to clump. So that will have the the sand particles clump together. And then if I go into so I'm using vellum grains. So let's go in there. And let's see what that will do. So again, now we're just looking at a very low resolution sim, so I'm but I'm I'm importing the, the sphere there. And let's wait until it moves up. Let's, let's look what this is gonna do. So this is just loading uh, the grains here. So geometry and constraints. It's just a very basic realm setup. So I didn't really do anything really custom here. Um, but this, this just creates a sand simulation. So if you revert this back to a high resolution one, which has a ton of points, um, and then if I load it here, you 
And basically what you're going to get is uh, it's still not super high res, but it's it's well, it was quite far away. So how many points is this? It's uh, 370,000 points. So you can see there's there's some it's coming out of the sand. And then I'm uh, I'm just deleting some stuff on top. Uh, I'm time shifting it to uh, yeah, well, basically to clamp to the last frame. So then so that it'll stick to being this frame. And I'm creating a VDB out of it. And then I'm smoothing the VDB and then I'm converting it to a mesh. Um, so let's, uh, let's go in here. So yeah, this is a little slow to generate. So, but I meshed it out. So that's, uh, so this is basically what that, what that looks like. And again, we're seeing it from quite far away. So it doesn't really matter that much. Um, that it's a little bit jittery, and if you visualize it with the uh, with the orb, where do we have the orb? Do we have the orb here somewhere? Yeah, we have it. All right, so we have that pulling out, and now it looks a little bit like mud, but again, doesn't really matter for this. Oh, and then what what I'm doing here is I'm just uh, transferring the UV. I didn't really need that proper UVs for this because it was barely visible, but. This way, I at least get like some UVs which are generated, like transferred from the from the ground. So that's the that's the mud, and this is uh, this also goes into the uh, collision geometry. So let's go into that, and then we'll start talking about the leaves. So let's go into the ground collision. Um, so what I have here is I have I have this this thing that I made, and. Uh, I bullied out the top because what I want to do is I have I have my ground here and I'm merging these two together. Uh, let's, uh, let's look look what that looks like. And I'm just raying a grid on it. So let's yeah, put out a null so I can easily visualize it. So this will basically just give me this. Um, you might think, why the fuck am I doing this? Well. This is going to be um, less heavy to if I if I cache this out. This is only going to be 3.73 megabytes per frame, uh, and this is going to be 210. So this is going to be faster to load in as a collision geometry in all of the simulations. So I just cache that out. So then I just have a grid which does this. So I can use that as a collision. Um, so at least the leaves get pushed up a little bit. It's not really that visible, but and then I have a time blend here because uh, without a time blend, it cannot generate sub steps. Um, uh, let's see what this is doing. Uh, wasn't even using the proper frame range, so I guess it wasn't even using it in the final simulation. I guess. Oh, it is okay. Mm. Right, there we go. Let's go to. All right, so I guess it wasn't even using it in the final simulation. <laughs> it's a funny, funny discovery. Right, anyway, but now it is. So there's that. Uh, yeah, so let's continue. All right. Um, so let's dive into one of the sims, and again, I already went over um, a lot of this stuff. Uh, so it's just it's basically it's uh, it's just creating some points and then doing doing this whole things with the with the leaves. But actually, the interesting thing is that I'm also using some wedges. So if we go in here, as you can see, this is the um, this is the vortex. But actually, these are 10 different simulations merged together. And the reason why I did this is because if I had an entire, like a very big pile of leaves, a lot of stuff would start interpenetrating uh, and then become, and then I need a ton of substeps and constraint iterations, it would just get super slow. So what I just did is I, I ran atop a lot of uh, uh, wedges. So as you can see, these are all of the different wedges. And just merging them together. And this would make the whole thing a lot faster. And I could just uh, later, when I wanted to do the final sim, I would just crank up the the wedge count to ten, and then the, and then everything would uh, would work like that. Um, so yeah, I'm, what I'm doing here in the valve top, and I actually discovered 
maybe a bug when I was recording this. I'm not sure because right now I'm using attribute names uh, to evaluate these values in here. So if I click in here, you can see uh, C changes, but I actually didn't do that in my original file. So, and now I had to do it because it was certainly not working. So maybe it's something that changed between Houdini builds. But uh, anyway, I digress. Um, so what, actually what I'm doing is if you create a wedge in here, you can point it to para parameters and say it, it has to be between certain values and the wedge count. And then you can point them in here to the po certain value and put them in seed in here. And again, I didn't need to do, do the add seed before. Uh, so I'm not sure what changed. First, I could just point it to it and it would work, but for some reason right now it wasn't evaluating, so I changed that. Um, there might be a bug, I don't know. Anyway, so what this will do is we'll just create uh, 10 different values for the seed, for example, between 0 and uh, 100,000. And so if I click these wedges, you can see the number change. Put it to random samples. And let's cook, cook this again. So if you do Shift V, it'll cook that. And it'll take a while. Because they actually do need to be random samples. But again, I, uh, I just changed this up a little bit uh, just now because for some reason it was working. So let's wait for this to finish. All right. So again, now you can see I get random, random seeds. Uh, and so that way I can run multiple simulations and just merge them together. So the way I merge those together later is what I do is I just create one point here. So a single point. Then I copy them by the uh, a copy uh, total of 10. So this is just linked to this parameter. So I, then I get 10 points. As you can see 10 points. Then I do a point, so a connectivity for a point. And then I'm just I'm looping over each individual point. And I created a uh, metadata import. And then over here in the file node, I'm uh, looking at the detail attributes. So I'm just looking at the iteration. So this has an attribute called iteration. So that's the current iteration that it's on. And that will also correspond to the wedge number. So then if I put it to here to the uh, which version do I want. So I just have a slider for the version. And then to the... Uh, to the to the wedge, then I can, so you can see here are all my ten wedges. Uh, there are eleven wedges apparently for the final one that I did. Um, so then what that will do is it will load in all of the wedges and then it will merge them together. So then you get this 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 whole uh, cool thing. And then in here in the in the in the Rob network. So this will also ch uh, change some other parameters. So I'm also changing something in here in the, the multi value. So this the at multi multiplier. So this go will go between 0 0.9 and 1.12. And this uh, I have some values here, and they are multiplied by this global parameter. So every simulation that I run will have slightly different values inside of inside of it. So I will go over these uh, a little bit later. Um, and this can be deleted, by the way. So, anyway, I think I, I think this can be deleted as well. At least I have some I have some cleanup left to do. Um, anyway, so that's how the wedging in here works. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go into the simulation itself. All right, so let's dive into the simulation stuff. So this only gets emitted in one frame, and I'm also I'm copying the whole thing. Uh, over here, when I go to Venom Sim, so I'm copying the thing here uh, with a little bit of rotation, so I would get some uh, some more leaves uh, to stack up a little bit. Um, anyway, so let's uh, let's let's look at this. So it will collide with the ground. So again, this is our uh, ground collider that we made um, that we made before, and this is our orb collider. And they need to be surface collisions, else it uh, else it won't work. Uh, again, because uh, Vellum uses surface collisions, so point-based collisions, not volume collisions. Right. So I have a couple of forces here. So this is just a general sort of um, force here that 
that it just blows the leaves around a little bit. Um, but a lot of the other ones are uh, put on groups. So this is put on stick, this is put on... Uh, this isn't put on anything and this only goes on a certain frame. So we have a sub solver here. Um, so yeah, let's dive into the sub solver and this will put a uh, class on it. So every uh, leaf will get a, get a uh, get its own class and it gets promoted to uh, to point. And then we have a primitive wrangle here. Uh, actually you call the point wrangle because I'm doing it over over points but again it was uh, when I was making it so it will create a random value based on the class so that value will be so it will be between 0 and 1 and then in here I have a group expression which is grouping the points and let's uh, let's look what this look let's see what this looks like And why is it not? Ah, yeah, there, there we go. Alright, let's remove this. So, as you can see, for some reason, if I have it keyframed, it wasn't doing anything. But this is randomly grouping, um, grouping these leaves. For some reason, I cannot see it when it's scrubbing. So, this will randomly grab them. And so this will be the stick group. And then the other one is I'm transferring a attribute called noise force, which is uh, generating outward from the center. So I just have a point here and it's generating outward. So slowly it's animating outward. Uh, as you can see here, so this is just, so if I put it in, uh, put in the color, you can see it. Let's, uh, Ramp on attributes, noise force. Right. So you can see I have an attribute like moving outward like that. And then I'm grouping it. So if noise force is bigger than zero, then group noise force e equals one. All right. So what that will mean is if something is um, not in the stick attribute, it will, uh, so if, if something is in the stick group, it will apply this force. If it uh, so, this an excess force will have it twirl, twirl around and move upward. Um, if it's like not in the if, so, if it's in the noise force, it will apply this um, this this uh, yeah, this noise basically. So this is just this this will just move them around because it's just a uh, just an animated noise. Uh, and another one here, uh, regular. Regular pop force, which slowly be gets gets bigger. This gets applied to the entire thing. This gets only applied uh, like during the time when the orb is exploding. So this just creates a very short vortex. And this is then this and this one has the same thing, and it will blast them outwards. And it only gets applied when the orb is exploding. So this is just based on the freeze frame. So. So it's just it's a little, it might even be a little bit confusing with all of these all of these groups, but basically what they're doing is they're just controlling that a randomized amount uh, will move uh, based on the wind. So you can see you have a couple like slowly like moving, sort of uh, sort of as if they're controlled by wind, and they will get more and more. And then uh, when the orb starts flying upwards, and the attribute will spread. And then they will start being at, being infected by the uh, excess force, which will start pushing them upwards. So that's, uh, that's, that's this one. So this is also, if we can, uh, so the shape starts over the radius of zero. And if I just keep it playing, we'll see it will grow out. And then it'll start picking them up based on the stick group so we need to wait for a couple of more frames and then it will start uh, and we'll start doing that so bear with me all right there we go so you can see it starts growing and initially not a lot is happening yet but you can see there's starting to be a little bit of movement
and then everything starts moving upwards and uh, doing cool things so yeah that's how the um, how basically how most of the sims in here work and so it's a lot, a lot of stuff is a is a copy from this but this one uses the uh, uses the wedging and a lot of the other stuff don't use the wedging so again now we can clean clean a lot of this stuff up because a lot of these were also test setup so um but a lot of oh fuck so a lot of these um these things use the same sort of sort of setup so if i look at this so this is uh stuff that's scattered on the front so you yes, can there's a there's like a couple of leaves that are moving in the wind sort of like blowing around and then they will sort of move upwards and then get pulled in so again that also uses a sub solver let's, let's dive in there again class uh, fly the fly up and if it's in a group fly up um, it will add a count and then if uh, so add count 0 0.1 and if count is is greater than one then uh, then act, then active active leave give one blah 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 blah. So this was basically what this does is it will um, add a force that will blow them up sort of in the up direction um, for a couple of frames and then they will um, and then they will sort of start started getting added into the into the vortex. So let's. Uh, for example, if I put this up farther, let's uh, then you can see what I mean. And let us uh, let's turn down the uh, the seat for this. Uh, let's uh, the uh, total count so we so it's going to be a little bit faster to to see what's going on. All right, so let's put it to auto update. Let's do compute of this stuff first. Right, there we go. So this is gonna fall down. There we go, so now we have some falling leaves. Right, so as you can see, now we open the count, you can see some leaves just get blown upwards, like a lot. So they, they just keep moving upwards. Um, so that's this one is is moving them upwards. Um, that's because they are in that group. So if you put it down again, so it will only happen for a couple of. If I put it to one, it will only happen for ten frames. So they slowly. So that was to do. So they wouldn't just get pulled instantly in the vortex. I wanted to like, I wanted them to move like this. So up and then into the vortex. So. Just a small detail, and again, all the all, all of the other stuff here is just it's um, just adding more forces and like you can you can go through this. Um, just basically it was just me adding forces and like tweaking it um, to try to get it to look the way I wanted to, but nothing um, nothing game changingly different inside of this network than the other one. So another one is the emit sides, uh, and again this is also somewhat the same. So a lot of the stuff is the same. So what we have here is, is a, uh, it's a like this is uh, so some points and there's points being generated on the uh, so I have a tube and I have a grid. So there's points being scattered on both. So just different seed every frame, and then this is all sort of the same. And then it gets added in here with a lot of the same forces, um, but we'll just like suck them inwards and then do some timing stuff and then then it will blow out. So all of these things are like somewhat the same. Fly front, uh, blah, blah blah blah. So this this is not not uh, that interesting. It's just a lot of these elements. You just make them separately and then add them up, and it's way better to do it separately than doing it in one simulation. Because this is just more controllable, and I just started stacking up uh, different elements to create uh, something that I thought looked really cool. And then in the end, it all looks like one big simulation, but it's all it's, it's split up into multiple parts. So something you might have noticed is that 
a lot of the simulations, and basically all of them, have this uh, pop effect by volumes. And that is generated by the bird. So I didn't make the bird myself. Uh, so let's let's dive in the in the bird and we have it we have it here. Uh, a very nice animated bird. I didn't make this, it was made by this guy. Uh, Asim 3D. So shout out to him. So this was the bird that I used. I'm not a character animator, I'm not that great of a modeler, so I just got this model and I uh, animated it along a path myself. Um, so shout out to him. But this was also used to to generate velocities that drive the uh, that drive the, the leaves. So uh, let's dive into how that was done. Mm. All right. So let's uh, let's look at this uh, this bird. So all right. So we have this have this bird here doing like uh, doing like this. So it's I I did animate it a little bit myself uh, in the beginning. So. Like the the start animation, it, like it grows and it spreads out its wings, and then it just switches to the uh, to the uh, to the thing to the uh, to the main animation. I did it in Cinema for the um, just tweak the bones a little bit, so it's just very simple. Uh, just animated the bones, um, and then what I did is I so it wasn't really looking as majestic. As a, a, like like this as I wanted to, so I just I stretched out the wings to be bigger. So as you can see, there's a difference here between this and this. And I was gonna scatter leaves on it anyway, so funky geometry doesn't matter. And this just gets blend shaped into each other, so like that. And then we have uh, have a bird. And then what I did is I have a have a path here. So if we look at this, so this is uh, this is the path that it flies. So it just gets converted to a. Uh, so I just drew with a uh, with a curve, and I converted it to NURBS curve. And I'm converting it, uh, resampling the points, blah, blah blah blah, polyframe, whatever. But then what I'm doing is, is I'm how I'm animating it across the. So polyframe is meant to set the tangent. So I'm setting the normals in the direction of the curve. So if you put polyframe, you put tangents to normal, then it'll set the normals in into like across to, to follow the curve. Uh, anyway, so anyway, so then what I'm doing is like smoothing it a little bit, and then I'm carving it. So I have the second view set to be the first view, but with a little bit added to it. And then what you get is it just carves it. Um, so I'm just animating that. So if you, come in, if you can see, so it, it will just it will animate a, like across the curve. So if you do a copy to points, uh, if I put this in here, put the sphere in here. No, not a spec. Keep always accidentally adding the spectrum. Right. So that will just basically animate. The curve so then I can animate it across the curve and it will get added into the direction of the uh, of the curve because of the normal um, and then I'm blasting away one of the points so I'm left with only one point and then I'm animating the, the bird on it and then we have a nice flying bird and after that I'm switching it on and off uh, like after a certain thing else it'll try to scatter the leaves on it even after the bird has disappeared and then you get like a pile of leaves there so that's why the switch is there um oh and this other is the bird center so that's why the why the like that we have the light in center of the of the of the bird i will, I will go into this later when we're talking about lighting that might be a better better way to uh, to go about it uh, anyway, so this bird also generates velocities. So let's dive into how these velocities work. All right. So if we go into the uh, eagle falling leaves node, so this is where the velocity gets generated, basically. So I just did a very simple pyro sim for this. So if we go in here, so the eagle gets uh, gets merged in here. So let's uh, let's look at that. So yeah, we have the eagle here, and then I'm just creating density from it. So this is basically density I'm creating, and then I have a pyro. I have a pyro sim here. This is 
almost a completely shelf tool thing and it's super low resolution but i'm only gonna use it for the velocity anyway so it doesn't really matter so i'm just like sourcing the bird into it and so it's sourcing so it's, it's basically it's creating wind so this is basically just using pyro to create a to create velocity that can drive the the wind so you can see it's super low resolution and it's super fast to sim but then you get you get this so so this is basically from the bird and this is going to advect all of our all, all of our um, all of our simulations so let's go back to what i cached out for that so if you scatter some points in here and all right let's get a couple of points and only do it in the density i guess and then do a volume trail and i have these points and i'm gonna trail the one velocity volumes all right so now you can see i get uh, i get these I get these trails so as you can see this is this is basically what the uh, what the, what the bird is doing this look this looks pretty cool by itself actually i should render this um so this is getting used in every simulation to drive the the leaves so for example if i have the um, so if i go in uh which one let's do the let's do the, the regular one and let's put it to a single pass because that's going to be faster um so you like falls down and then as you can see there there it's where our where our bird passes by so then it gets blown up and then then it gets like this also gets blown to the camera so that's quite cool and then we have a ton of leaves that looks super cool so i really loved how that how that turned out in the in my first like one of my er earlier iterations i just had the bird go out and then fly to the camera and it just looked very way too fast and this this was a lot more work to add into it but uh it really really looked uh, yeah i mean really adds to the whole thing in my opinion uh so yeah basically that's that's how all of the uh the velocities uh are done and those are added into every single simulation all right so that thing gets added basically everywhere so here's another sim that i did um it's basically it's a box here volume let's carry some points in it then when we go in here uh basically what it does is just it it submits points in it so let's look at that and then it's just it has the same sort of uh type forces so the excess forces and some other stuff and the pop it back by volume again apparently it has a double pop it back by volume for some reason i'm not sure why so this um these are the very tiny particles that are flowing around, which you don't really see that much, but they're like a little bit in the depth of field. I did have them bigger at some point, but they just didn't look good. Um, so yeah, but again, everything everything that happens is being advected by the um, uh, by the uh, 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 pyro simulation, and that just just creates these really cool effects like this, for example. Like the shockwave you have when the when the when the orb explodes, so you have like the fly front effect, and then so we have like like that stuff happening. Actually, the shockwave was just with a with a um, I think with a pop attract. It wasn't done with the uh, with the velocity. So that was if you go in this one. I think that was, uh, where is it, this one, like it gets activated as a lot, a lot of force, because it just looked very really cool to have it like shoot backwards, It'll really get blasted out. Anyway, but I digress. 
so let's let's continue on some uh, on some other stuff. So we have another simulation which is uh, where we also generated the velocity. So if we're back here, so we're back here into to where we created the smoke. And another thing we I did here is I'm loading the bird and I'm just scattering points on the bird and I'm done adding them into another simulation here which just has like these leaves just falling and again you can see these are being advected from the get-go like really cool by the by the by the smoke so you have these lovely uh, trolls and everything is uh, just all of these small details really add to the whole uh, to the whole thing in my opinion um, so yeah, that's, that's the last of the uh, of the actual simulations, I think. Let me go through the uh, through the whole thing again. Oh, there's another one, it's like small grain. You don't really see this actually that much. Well, you see it a little bit. Uh, it's just it's a couple of points, just grains fall, falling from the orb when it's uh, when it's falling down. It was just like as if sand would fall down, but it. Just a very small element to it and another element that i have which i added later after the final render was done because the entire thing was rendered in one go and there's hardly any compositing but this thing was added later because i i felt i needed more of a shock wave so what i did is i have i have this uh so it's uh So this is what creates sort of airflow effect when the uh, when the bird explodes. And again, this is a super low resolu resolution sim, but it it just creates a so I have a sphere. Um, at the, why is it? Why am I not? Oh, this wait. I need to load this in prop because I did this in a separate uh, separate scene initially. Uh, and then I merged it in here later to share it with you guys right all right so I have that and I'm just creating a um, just points and then a source and I'm just doing it putting it in a pyro simulation which actually uses combustion because I wanted expansion in the whole thing and we have, to, we have the ground loaded in and the way the ground is used as a collision volume here because you need um, you need like uh, volume collisions so you just have an extrude volume there and then that's that's loaded in here uh, anyway so this just like it, it has a lot of uh, uh, fuel added in the beginning and a lot of temperature and then it just gets animated down and I just try to time the whole thing with the camera moving backwards and then in here uh, I don't think I did any keyframes but the whole thing like it has a lot of gas release and the burn rate is super high so the whole thing expands like super fast and just uses a lot of the, the basic shelf tool things and then we just get this uh, expanding smoke thing which is used for the uh, create a cool uh, wind blowing effect uh, so yeah then we then we get then we get this All right, where do we go it's a very 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 short simulation as well and then I'm again I'm also using that inside of a pop simulation and that's uh, that blasts this uh, these points so yeah, that's uh, then we also have these points. And then the thing that I'm using in the shader later is uh, I have some alpha here, um, so that it just gets ramped in based on the age. So it casts some, it fades out a little bit, and does some does some stuff. So yeah. And a little bit of random p scale again, also for the uh, for the shader. And this one can be removed. Right, so one more thing I uh, almost forget to mention is we have, of course, also the main eagle. Um, yeah, there's this guy over here. Um, 
so yeah what we have here is which is we have the eagle loaded in uh, I have him I have him remeshed here uh, and then I'm scattering points on him and then point deforming it so then we get a uh, get just the points flapping so they like if I wouldn't do the point deform then they would like start scattering everywhere every frame um, and I have like this one set to curvature and add some more on the wings and I'm just I'm creating these instances I did did these as geometry um, so we have so we have the leaves here and I did these as geometry because I wanted them to also be able to sort of animate so if I do a time shift so you can see I have a noise animating through it so it would be like simulate sort of wind going going through it a little bit and we need to do that based on our rest position so I'm time shifting a frame here and then I'm creating a rest position and then I'm doing it based on the rest position of the uh, second input so where is it where am I loading the rest position let's look Ah, there we go rest and it's going from the uh, second input and for some reason I am doing this from the wrong input so it should go in here doesn't make that much of a, much of a difference but then you have the uh, yeah, well you have the bird here um, and I'm trailing it, of course, because I want velocity. And then I'm adding alpha because I'm using alpha and the shader. So everything that has, every node that has leaves needs to have alpha set in, else it, uh, else it won't work in the shader later on. All right, so let's continue. Oh, another thing that I still needed to mention is I have this rub net here. And this merges all of the, um, all of the uh, rubs. And you can run the whole thing in one go. So... It just references all of these things. So if you want to simulate the whole thing, just run this robnet, and then everything should uh, should work basically. Uh, well, should just run in one go. Uh, you need to run the vellum separately for the um, for the vortex. So uh, just so you know. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's start rendering some stuff. So let's open up the right shift render view. So the way I usually set stuff up is I uh, create render nodes, which load the uh, load all of the stuff and then I do some if I need to uh, change some parameters in there I will do that in there so I will just load them from the simulation into a render node and then I have all of the render stuff in there and this is set up with uh, with RNDR and then let's do it like this so if I go to the out menu and you go to orb leaves so everything that has RNDR underscore and then a star gets picked up by the render so it will i don't it doesn't matter if i like i don't have to manually select them in here as long as i call something r and dr then it will render and then i do the same with uh, lights so everything that's called rsl will be uh, picked up as a light so if i decided i don't want a light i could just like change the uh, like uh, change the name and then it'll be ex excluded um, but this kind of makes it nice to like if I if I want to add like one other other light I could just add it manually in here. Uh, but I like to I like this to keep things organized. Um, so yeah, let's find a uh, frame. Let's render render a frame. This is the whole thing is like quite slow if I have to be honest. All right, so let's uh, let's go in here. All right, so this this looks okay. And let's uh, let's press render, and uh, hopefully it doesn't crash. All right, there we go. So as you can see, basically the entire thing uh, is rendered in one go. So let's go over some things, and uh, hopefully this should keep recording properly. Um, so I'm doing some depth of field. Uh, as you can see, so this is my render camera. The way depth of field is done is I have redshift camera. It's all rendered in uh, in render because uh, I found with a lot of like small elements in, in front and particles, like it doesn't look good when you do it in compositing. And then I rather render it. Uh, so this is looking at uh, vector length to origin. 
um, sort of origin of the camera and then it's gonna look at orb animate sim so it's gonna look at the orb and it's gonna stay focused on the orb so it just looks at where the orb is basically so it's always focused on the orb and another thing that I have is I have this bokeh image uh, which just looks kind of cool so let me uh, let me grab that so it's basically it's this image so it does does a little bit of sort of a chromatic aberration type type look and it does actually sort of significantly change the image so if I turn it off see it does look a little bit different actually not as bad as I thought it might I actually tried also making a bokeh which would be the the, the look of a leaf but I didn't end up doing that um, so yeah let's go over some of the of the lighting um, I'm trying to get better at lighting this was I was quite happy how the lighting in this one turned out especially compared to what it started off uh, in the beginning all right so I have a couple of a couple of, of lights. so the top light is that's the basic light uh, here so that's um, hopefully this will allow me to so everything is like quite slow it's like quite a heavy scene with all of the leaves so as you can see that's a light uh, coming from the top there and also affects the volumetrics like I have volumetric scattering um, in the render so how that is done is uh, if I go in here uh, so just crop illumination basically is, is just I use brute force and the way I why I use brute force is in the previous project I uh, I was using Iridium's point cloud and that worked quite well up until a certain point and then it started going out of VRAM and then I couldn't figure out why it was constantly crashing with brute force at least it continues rendering and because I had so many many little leaves going on I figured uh, for the hell of it let's just render it as a uh, uh, brute force it rendered quite quite fast it was between like three and seven minutes per frame I think for the final thing Anyway, I'm using volumetric, uh, volumetric shattering, uh, scattering. So that's enabled with some settings. Not sure what else I should say about that. And then I have a uh, volume shader here, which I'm in here. So I'm just using noise, a little bit of noise in here, uh, which will make it a little bit less uniform. And you can just put it in the uh, in the uh, in the volume tab so for example if I would make this black you will probably see some sort of a difference uh, I think I need to reload the sequence if I do this ah there you go you can see then then it becomes more defined um, so there's just a little bit of noise going on inside of the uh, of the shader which just helps breaking up everything just a little bit um, and didn't end up using that. Uh, uh, all right. So that's how the volume. And I just I liked having everything in render. I just wanted the whole thing to do well to render in one go. So that's the top light. Uh, I have the leaf light volume, which is the light coming from here. I used to have a light going coming like that from the top, um, but a friend of mine said it didn't really look good, so I ended up changing that a little bit. Uh, so if I just increase the exposure here, you can see what which one that is. So you can see that is uh, that is basically filling that in. Um, it just looks uh, looks pretty cool in my opinion. All right. So we have a rim light, um, which is creating. You can really see it in the progressive mode, but it it creates sort of a rim around this uh, this orb and so if you're doing stuff like that you kind of want to create a uh, uh, like a region render and I mean redshift is super fast but like if you're having dealing with like heavy things like this it's still uh, it can be quite slow All right so let's go to bucket mode Let it render, let it render. 
All right, so yeah, so you have, like, you have this little rim over there. Um, so let's go to a, um, so particle lights, basically this is just a, a light dome uh, and it's only put on the wind particles. So those are those, are those particles. Uh, I just wanted them to be sort of visible all of the time. I didn't want them to be really be, be uh, affected by a lot of the other lighting. So I just used enable light mass associations and just select them, render wind particles. And then that will, um, yeah, basically uh, uh, just light them out as being sort of white, but they're like very subtle, so um, that 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 worked quite well for what I wanted to do. All right, so let's focus on the bird. So this is another frame. Uh, you can see the bird, and the bird has this light inside of it. Um, I wanted it to be sort of the uh, we have the light orb go moving down in the beginning, which is the aerosol fall fall down. So, uh, and all of the glows, by the way, are just with done with post effects. I'm rendering them directly to the file. Um, anyway, so this this thing, I wanted to be sort of a clicker, sort of his life essence, like the glowy heart type of uh, type of thing. Um, and that's that's this one. So it's RSL bird light. So it's a spherical light, and it's not visible. But it does have like volume contribution. So if I were to put this up, then you can see what it does. So let's uh, wait for it to uh, to do things again. So you can see that's with the uh, what that is doing. And I have like the the volume samples are set a little bit higher with this one. So the thing is, if you have volume samples on the light super low and you uh, crank up the unified sampler, so the max samples in here. Uh, what that ends up doing is creating splodges. Um, so you need also to up your volume samples if you're doing stuff like this. If you do 16 here and then crank it up here with your uh, max samples, we will get it will sort of because it won't have enough samples and then it will sort of oversample all of these individual uh, things. I cannot show it in this example. I have another tutorial coming up quite soon. Um, uh, which will go into more detail on that because that had a lot of volumetrics as well. But anyway, you will see that later. Um, so yeah, the way this tracks the bird, so let me turn this off, go to scene view, I'm going to transform. So this will look at the centroid of Eagle Animate Bird Center. And this is what I mentioned before. So basically what this does is so it clamps to the first frame so this is the first frame and then this animates as you as you as you'd expect and then what i'm doing is i'm blasting away two two points inside of the eagle so you have these uh these, this eagle and basically it's it's a point on his uh bottom and on his front so it's sort of where his where his heart would be i i imagine and i'm creating a line so you have this line inside of this eagle and I'm resampling it to have an extra point and that extra point will be exactly in the center and then I'm blasting away everything except for that point and then I have the exact center of this bird. I was trying with like just a regular centroid of the bird before but the thing is when you do that it will cause the bird like the wings are flapping so they're they're flapping. Um, and what that will do is like I will uh, I will show you with a uh, bound. Like if I refer to the center of this thing, the center is always changing. Like if I were to uh, assemble, I can show you. So if I pack this and then add it and just create the uh, centroid. So just keep the center point and then copy to point. Right. So, and then if I visualize the bird, then I make this a little bit smaller. So as you can see, this is not really working. It's like it's moving. 
So that's why you need something like this to keep it nice and centered. All uh, right. So yeah, that's doing the uh, the center of the bird light, and that's doing the uh, the thing. And all of the other lights, like I have a ton of other. So I have this orb light, for example, and that is uh, in the center of the orb. And this uh, this wiggles a little bit. I think I'm not. Oh, I'm not using even. I was using a multiplier thing for the before. Oh, I am. Sorry. Um, or I'm not, no. Uh, but yeah, all of the the lights and the flickering, the lights, a lot of it is really done in render, so not not necessarily in comp. I have some extra flicker and stuff going on in the in comp. But most of it is uh, it's actually done in in render. Um. So yeah, these are all of the lights, and I don't ha I haven't used any HDRI. I really wanted it to also be sort of a lighting exercise for myself. Um. So yeah, these are all of the lights. Oh, and this light bird top, uh, that's basically a light that's used to fill in when the bird comes uh, close to the um, to the camera. So if I have this thing here, and let's uh, visualize the correct, let's visualize the correct um, frame. So then it will. Why is this not working? Oh, I still have the time shift on. All right, so what this basically does is when the bird will come in, it will it it just it fills in the uh, the bird a little bit. So let's uh, let's render that frame. Let's wait for it to uh, fire up again. Which again is quite slow. That's the thing with Redshift is super fast, but when you have heavy heavy scenes, uh, time to first pixel isn't isn't that great. Hopefully, with like uh, Hydra, it'll um, coming coming soon in Houdini 18. Hopefully, that'll speed things up a little bit, um, because as you can see, this this takes like quite a while, right? So you can see like the nice light from the from the heart of the of the bird. Uh, so if I exposure this up, you should probably be able to see what I mean. This might also overdo it significantly. Yeah, so you can see like this. Uh, this is lights lights up the the bird. Um, let's turn it down again. So if I turn it off, I'm not sure how big of a difference it'll make, but. Uh, let's wait for it to do things. Yeah, you can see now it's it's a little bit darker. Um, and just use it to fill in the lights uh, lights a little bit uh, with the uh, for the bird. So yeah, that was basically I think most of the lighting. Uh, yeah. So as I guess again, I haven't used any of the uh, any HDRI. Right? It was all uh, manual lighting. Um, Another thing and I want to mention with the camera is the way I did the camera animation. So let's turn off the eagle main and let's turn on the ground. So if the camera animation and being pushed back by the shockwave here. Uh, so there's not a lot of wiggle on it, but like it's basically a camera animation, but then I have a little bit of wiggle on the rotation and the translation. Um, what I usually do is I have a main no, which doesn't really do a lot. So I just only use that to center the camera a little bit more. Uh, and then I have one in between, which does wiggles, um, which is nice because if I want to do, if I wanted to stack wiggles, I could just add an extra null, and then I could just like add another one with more noise. And why he's not doing? Why you like? Nice. There we go. And then. You can see you can just stack it that way. Um, so that's it's highly preferable to doing it on the camera itself directly. There, there is a little bit of wiggle, by the way, because that was used for the orientation. Uh, I kind of needed that to be there. Um, so that's, that's how the camera was done. 
All right, now let's quickly dive into a couple of uh, shader, if, uh, shaders. Oh, and another thing, I have a global multiplier here, which I used, I think, on some lights where I'm multiplying the intensity by the global multiplier. I first, I was like also fading in lights and fading out lights based on this, but I didn't end up using that until the end. But uh, oh, another thing is I the volume wind, so the stuff in here is just rendered with a separate. Um, in the, in the subnet and has separate lights so those are uh, those lights because uh, it was a separate element and I didn't want to like and it didn't look good with the regular lighting that I had I was going to comp it in anyway so that's what I did and another thing that I did is I have a version number here so everything is just being output to uh, basically to a version and the name um, and then it all ends up in the correct location I can just version up in this one and then it will uh, then it all when I render it it will just end up in the correct location and the AOVs are done in here uh, just all the basic AOVs I ended up comping on the beauty so I didn't really use a lot of this I did end up using the crypto mat but uh, for the most part not a lot of EOVs. Like I, I really tried to getting as far as I could just in the regular render. All right, so let's continue. All right, so a couple of more things about the shading, but the shading was actually quite simple. Uh, not a lot going on. So the main material that I'm using for the ground is, uh, so if you go in here, so it's a uh, beach floor. So that's what one, and it's a, uh, if you look it up, it's a, uh, it's a mega scans asset. So so it's this one, um, but I am mixing some displacement from from something else. Uh, and again, I fucking hate that bug. So I'm mixing in some displacement from, no, not from that entire path. Let's copy it properly. So I'm mixing in some displacement from this one because I didn't like the way the displacement just looked on the regular thing. So I'm just mixing that together. But apart from that, um, not that much is different. So I just have a color corrector to sort of darken it a little bit. Um, and I am using alpha. And basically the alpha is just sort of, if you look in here, it just has a little bit of a fade out towards the end. But that's basically what uh, ground shading was like. Um, the glass is a another mega scans material. Fucking bugs, man! Jesus fucking Christ! Uh, right. So there's another one. Frost. Why is that not? Why is it not finding that one? But that's another one. It's a sort of a frosting effect, which was on the, um, yeah, which is on it. And then the the, the, re the reflection is modulated by uh, Fresnel. So it's not as intense on the front as it is on the side. Um, and the particles, very basic material, looking up an attribute called alpha, uh, turning it down a little bit in here and basically putting it in opacity and that's everything that's 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 there for the particles they have a little bit of a color but yeah in terms of shading that's it basically it's it's honestly not too complex um all right so this very very quickly over the compositing i wasn't sure if i was going to even include this but uh because it's like it's really not that much uh to say about the compositing um so it's quite a simple comp. Uh, I've done it in After Effects. I know After Effects sucks, whatever, etc., etc. Anyway, there's a, a couple of wiggle stuff that I that I did, um, which is basically so the position, for example, has a wiggle effect, and that's pointing to the sliders here. So it will just wiggle when the um, when the explosion hits. Uh, this is all done in a pre-comp. So in the pre-comp, I did uh some of the shockwave stuff 
So this is also where the wind effect gets added. So this is the, uh, the uh, like a separate render of the wind effect. So that's very simple, that one. So it just gets uh, put on top, as some color correction stuff. Um, we this is also where we have a uh, have some bulges going on. So I have uh, let's call it. Let's actually give it good names. Um, yeah, this is just a, basically a bulge effect with a mask. So what that does is basically it uh, it sort of yeah it it sort of creates this shockwave effect. So it has just a feathered look, and what that does is just uh, really gives this shockwave. Type of type of effect, which just looks a lot better. Uh, so you have this initial shock, like doosh, and then you have the wind moving through it, and then you have the leaves being blown blown away by the wind and the shock wave. Um, so yeah, there's that. There's uh, just a couple of like there's a little bit of uh, glow here. There's just a little bit of extra optical flare thing, but again. Most is in render. If you can see, like I added, like this is uh, this is just the uh, like if I if I just uh, show the rough render, for example, like this is the this is the beauty render. So there's really actually not a lot of compositing going on, but but as you can see, like the explosion here is a little me. So then when you add like the bulge. And you get really in them when you add the, the wiggle. Like some of the color grading here. And you really get the shockwave type of effect. So that's uh, that's some stuff. Um, so yeah, basically that's that's the compositing uh, thing. And then here in the end I'm uh, doing a little wipe with a, with a little leaf. So, uh, so yeah, very short just the compositing. Not a lot going on, but... Uh, that's the compositing part of it, guys. Yeah, I think that's the entire project. Um, so yeah, I hope you found this whole interesting. Uh, it's been quite of a long one, I think. I'm not sure how long, because I still have to edit this whole thing, obviously. But uh, yeah, this whole thing was quite long, I think. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for your support again on Patreon. Thanks to all of the, all of the patrons. Um, and especially all of my top patrons, of course. Especially Chris Hebert for uh, being a top patron. But everyone, thanks. Thanks so much. And again, like it really means a lot to me that, that I have this support on Patreon. Because this really allows me to, to do these types of things. Actually, I took, took time off to do form commissioned work to, to make this personal project and make it into a tutorial. Which is something I can afford because, so, because Patreon is also bringing in some... Um, uh, bringing some income, which is very nice. And I really like to hopefully be able to do more of this because I really enjoy making these tutorials and making this type of content. Uh, anyway, so that was it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, well, until next time, guys. And uh, stay tuned for another thing that I have coming up, uh, well, probably in December. So uh, yeah, until next time. Bye.